this evening we are very privileged to have with us uh, two people that are going to help us uh, to do this. Uh, the first one is uh, probably someone who is, well, both I think are pretty well known uh, in the country. The first one is Kathy Moslatlana, and we thank her for uh, her time. She's uh, a South African writer. She worked a long time on TV. I remember way back, Kathy, interviewing me on uh, ENCA, uh, and she's currently Currently, the host of the uh, popular daily program on SAFM Talking Point. Uh, she has also won a National uh, Press Club Award. And uh, Kathy, if you listen to her, is listening to the experience of ordinary people every day. And uh, she is able to speak from listening to South Africans across uh, the country because her uh, program is broadcast acro across the country. And also with us, is uh, Professor Simpiwe Sesanti, who's professor at the University of the Western Cape. He's working in the Faculty of Education. Uh, he's the former editor of International Journal of African Renaissance. And uh, Professor Sesanti actually holds two PhDs, one in journalism studies and another one in uh, philosophy. And so we're also very happy to have him. He's widely published on a number of issues, including education, African philosophy, gender, journalism, politics, and uh, spirituality and religion. So to both of you, we are very grateful this evening uh, that you are with us. We're going to have a bit of a dialogue and then we will give you an opportunity if you'd like to ask questions. We ask that you use the chat function uh, to ask your uh, questions. It just helps us uh, to uh, move through the questions uh, quicker because normally the people have a number of questions. So we'll have a bit of a dialogue first and then we will open it up or any questions that you would like to ask. So I'm going to um, ask uh, Kathy to kick us off. Uh, just your sense, Kathy, of the state of the nation uh, as we move towards these elections. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Father Russell. Good evening, everybody. You're putting me a bit on the spot. I thought that, you know, we'd start with uh, the prof so that at least I can listen to what he says and <laughs> <laughs> amend my amend my thoughts accordingly. Um, but either way, thank you for the opportunity to be able to meet with everybody tonight and be part of this conversation. I think just to be brief on on my end, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I think this election is um, is largely going to be about is the reality of the two South Africas that we all live in. Um, we live in on the one end of in the South Africa where, yes, you know, there's potholes on the roads, there's load shedding, um, there's service delivery issues, but life is still able to go on because we're able to take our kids to private schools, we're able to go to private doctors where we need to. Um, so we we have a way of uh, buying and opting out of the system um, and that's for the one South Africa. The other South Africa unfortunately does not have those options, do not have those choices. So they do not have the option of getting private medical care, they do not have the option of getting private security to help uh, you know police their streets. They don't have the option of taking their, their kids to um, any form of private schooling. So that means that they are at the mercy of whatever the state of service delivery in the country is. And so when I think about the decisions that people are going to be making in this election, it's really about where they believe their interests are going to be best protected. So if you look at the high unemployment rate, and uh, many people will say, well, you know, in a country like South Africa, if you're making people promise is like uh, giving them 350 rand a month, it doesn't really make a difference in their lives. Whereas in fact, um, it is that 350 that these millions of South Africans that apply for it, that is the only access uh, to any kind of finances that they have at the end of the day. So what might not make sense to one part of South Africa is how the other half of South Africa literally really functions on a day-to-day. -day. So 
Yes, there are big issues that all of us know as a country we have to work on, we have to fix, but it is the lived experiences on a day-to-day -day basis that I think ultimately is going to be informing what voters do on voting day. And sometimes it is going to come down to the very basics that um, some might look at and it might not make sense, but in the other South Africa I was talking about, it really does come down to the bare minimum. I just want to know that if my child goes to school, they will still be able to get a meal. I want to know that I will still get my grant at the end of um, at the end of the month. So those uh, sometimes might seem like they are, um, you know, they, that why do people still care so much about it? They care about because it makes such a big difference um, in, 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 in their lives. So that's just um, uh, part of, of the perspective that I can build on as we continue. Thank you, Kathy. The idea that there are these two countries and uh, very often the one doesn't really know what is happening in the life uh, of the other uh, uh, country. Uh, Prof. Sisanti, uh, to kick off uh, your side, uh, what would you say uh, the state of the uh, of the nation is as we move towards uh, this uh, landmark, one could say, election uh, in just a couple of weeks? Good evening, good evening, everyone, and um, let me um, appreciate the points that were made by Kathy, and I'm very glad, in fact, uh, Father, that you began with her, uh, because uh, you know we're uh, being led by. It is only a confirmation of, um, I come from an African cultural background um, where being led by women um, is a very normal exercise. In fact, a very welcome exercise. Uh, be before we were invaded by patriarchy and all other cultural forces that uh, overthrew African culture, um, African women are known to have been at the center. So Kathy is simply reclaiming a space and a space that I'm very happy that uh, she is reclaiming. I'm comfortable with following her leadership. So thank you very much for, for your leadership, um, Kathy. And having said that then, you know, uh, perhaps I need to begin at that point um, where, you know, um, we know that um, leadership counts and it counts a lot. Um, when we examine the history of Kemet, um, which is known as ancient Egypt, um, you know, where our history as African people is rooted. Um, we know that um, the African people there always emphasized that uh, everything heavily depended on, uh, depended on leaders. And if we had leaders that were imbued by a sense of ma'at, meaning justice, truth, and balance, then certainly there was no doubt that uh, with such a leadership, we could move in a particular direction. And of course, leadership in the African continent in that cultural sense was not isolated. It itself depended um, upon those who um, were, are now regarded as the masses. And having said that, then, you know, one gets the sense that uh, coming to the modern day and the modern perhaps going quickly back to a point that was made by Franz Fanon before he transitioned, he said that, um, you know, Africa does not really suffer from many other things other than the fact that uh, what is most consciously absent is a clear sense of an, ideo an ideology, an ideology that will be able to advance the interests of the people. And already at that time, Franz Fanon was aware that um, you know there was a pervasiveness of Pan-Africanism and all that. But he was saying, he used a particular word that was translated in English. And he said, what is this African unity that is being spoken about? It is a vague idea because uh, this vagueness is um, articulated in the fact that there is no flesh put to the bone and no meaning. Meaning that therefore, you know, at the time that Fanon was writing, he was deeply concerned that the elite, um, you know, were, were giving mere sub lip service to the, to the real interests of the people. What they were, they were really advancing, where, you know, were their own selfish interests. And so um, almost 60 years since Franz Fanon articulated these words, we see this at play. Um, the, 
the kind of uh, misleaders that we have, you know, do not come across some of us as uh, truly being genuinely concerned about the poor in our societies. And so further, you know, let me not uh, go further than that. That that is my sense that when I look across, um, you know, I am not filled with a sense of despondency because sometimes when you feel despondent or disappointed, it is informed by the fact that you were hoping for the better. Um, but uh, I, I was not really expecting uh, much um, from our political leadership across. Um, um, and so um, what I'm being seen play, what I'm being, what I'm seeing being played out is something uh, that does not come to me as a surprise. And as I say, I'm not despondent, I'm not cynical, I'm not hopeless. I think um, where I sit, I'm simply being realistic and uh, seeing things for what I think they are. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Santi. Um, we speak about, uh, you know, the, the depth of problems in this country that, you know, whether we're talking about poverty, whether we're talking about service delivery, uh, whether we're talking about the, the state of infrastructure, uh, you both seem to be suggesting that what we really need to be focusing on is uh, the question of leadership, leadership, leadership. And what kind of leadership we as a country need now? Instead of thinking about figures, uh, people, should we be thinking about the kind of profile of a leader that this country needs uh, at the moment? Uh, is that a, is that a, is that another way of approaching to say, uh, you know, uh, we see so and so who's promising this, we see so and so. Let's put all those aside and let's say to ourselves. What kind of leader, before we consider individuals or personalities, what kind of leader does this country need at the moment? I don't know. Kathy? Well, I, I think the question of what kind of leader do we need is obviously an important one. Perhaps the dilemma that um, it might lead to is whether or not we have those leaders. Mm. Yes, we might have um, over 400 political parties that... Uh, you know, are officially registered. I think um, we, we have just close on 60 that are going to be participating in this election. So we don't have a shortage of people who have put their hands up and who say that they are leaders. The question is, do those individuals meet the bar of mm. what we think are leaders that we need for our society, that we need for this moment right now and it's a question that is probably you know two-pronged what is the leader that we need for South Africa today do we have those leaders in the current crop of options and what do we do if 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 there isn't a leader if we feel that there isn't uh, there is a gap between the two what do we do in the meantime because there's still a a country that needs to be run and how are we then as voters thinking um about it i mean i've i've heard some interesting things this election um but probably one of the ones that has stood out is even just this idea of um uh, voters having tactical votes so that you know you're voting with a particular tactic in mind because ultimately there is a certain uh, um, outcome that you anticipate as a voter. Now, whatever that outcome is, is, you know, it sits with the individual, but that then informs the kind of decisions that, that you're making, because there has to be balances in the system, right? Um, there has to be a way in which the system becomes more accountable um, to itself. And if one sits back, then some are saying, well, in order to maybe create more accountability, I'm going to strengthen the opposition. Other people believe, well, it's going to create more chaos. Uh, what if we go, what if we need a coalition government at a national level? So some then are saying, well, actually, I'm going to give my vote uh, to a party that I know is likely to stay in power. So there are different ways of approaching the question. Um, I just think that both conversations are probably happening at the same time. And we might not have the answer for 
one right now that needs to help us make a decision around who and who to vote for come the 29th of May. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Prof, uh, your view on that, uh, building on what uh, Kathy said there? Thank you very much, Father. Um, we again begin, you know, let me quickly make reference to a history um, of uh, Isuzulu speaking African people. At one stage, um, when the king, the then king uh, Shaka Kanandi, you know, not Kasenza Ngakona, came forth um, and demanded to those, I mean, demanded answers from those who had ill-treated his mother, they then said to him that um, they, were, they were following and obeying the instructions of the king. Then uh, he said to them, how dare you say that? Because a king can never and is never above uh, the wisdom of the ancestors. Um, and so if, you know, you were given a choice between what the king said and what the king said was in contradiction of the ancestors' wisdom, that is the philosophy of our ancestors, of Ubuntu, of justice, of fairness, then you had to, to, to defy the king and face the consequences. Meaning, therefore, that already at that time, you know, our ancestors had taught that uh, systems were more important than individuals. And so, therefore, at that point in time, justice had to be elevated at, at whatever cost. And so, having said that, then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to bring us to, to the importance of looking at systems and philosophical values or bases more than individuals themselves. And this is why I said earlier on, Fanon spoke about ideology where others, his predecessors or ancestors would have spoken about philosophy. So where we come from, you know, in this country, you know, there, there is often a discussion about uh, the constitution, the constitution, the constitution, all, of, all the time. Um, and, and the assumption is that this constitution is driven by a sense of justice. And yet we know, um, just very quickly, that um, in, in the interim constitution of 1993, there was in it a word Ubuntu, which was there, that, you know, there to be this foundation. But in the final constitution of 1996, interestingly, that word was removed, you know, for one reason or the other. And yet we know that Ubuntu in African philosophy and culture is the fundamental and key concept that speaks about humaneness, that speaks about, that speaks about justice, that anything and everything that is unjust, that militates against the poor, has got to give way. So the politicians knew bad why they, 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 they removed that. And perhaps, you know, they, they, they did so rightly because um, the kind of values that are called liberal values such as private ownership of property, you know, those who are power, powerful, continuing to own the, the uh, being in charge of the reins of, a, of the economic powers continue to be like that. Unless, you know, we begin to fundamentally challenge, it doesn't matter uh, who is the president, who is the prime minister, for as long as the system goes in a particular way, there is going to be no fundamental change. And so Father, you know, just to, 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 to sit down on this point that in, in, our, in our history and our, in our culture philosophy, the land, the land upon which everything is, was regarded as the common property of the ancestors. It could neither be sold nor be bought because our ancestors taught us that uh, if, as uh, Mualimu Julius Nyerere would say, that if you allow the land to be bought and to be sold, then those who are powerful are going to buy everything. And what is going to happen is that those who are poor will have nothing, as we see now. And we see the wisdom of our ancestors, you know, um, uh, being uh, tested too when they reasoned in that fashion. So unless you, you engage with that, and look, as, as I said, you know, the, the, the financial system, you know, for as long as I'm able to take my children to school, for as long as I'm able to pay the bond, uh, that you pay for 20 years. In, in, in our economic system of our ancestors, um, the interest was, was not an issue. You came further in our village, you'd be given a land, you don't have a goat or a cow, you'd be given, so that until you are on your feet, when you're on your feet, you'll simply give me what I gave you initially. But the, this system that is worldwide, you know, says that you own nothing 
for 20 years. And after 20 years, if you have the money, only then you are going to be condemned to, to die, to die if you don't have enough money, you know, to go to the best doctors. And yet, in the Sutu Kethi would bear with me, and it's not my language, but there's a the saying, Fita, Fita, Homo, Utswaremut, meaning that, um, you know, um, property, interest, and everything else is less important than the very. So, the kind of leader then that I would be able to listen, and I've not heard that leader, is the kind of leader that says, you know, uh, let us protect the poor and, and, and protect them and defend them. And that, uh, you know, we must be pro poor and make sure that we are in fulfillment of my art, which is justice, truth and balance and Ubuntu. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, colleagues. Uh, Professor Santi, I, I want to pick up on that. Um, and also I can put this to you, Kathy. Um, the, the question of pro poor. I mean, one of the difficulties we have is very often if you look at stuff that we have written, for example, in uh, manifestos, in what uh, you know, politicians say uh, does seem to indicate that we are pro poor, and yet, well, it, that some of them are pro poor, uh, and yet, very often, uh, are once an elections come and gone, <laughs> to actually put those things into practice seems to be the big, the big, the big issue. Uh, is it is it is it just about the system, or is there some gap there between our ability to put into practice the things that we claim? we uh, hold uh, fast to. And th there are countless examples of this. I mean, there's, there's many beautiful things, for example, in the South African constitution, and yet we know all too often there's a huge gap between uh, what's written in the document and the actual lived experience of, of millions of people, dare I say, in this country. I think he's waiting for you first, Kathy. <laughs> Prof, you want to go? Uh, he's saying you should go, Kathy. <laughs> okay, he's waiting for me. Um, look, you know, this is, it's, I mean, it's such a, an interesting debate. And when we think about just what would, what does a pro-poor government look like? I tend to rely a lot on some of the work that is coming out of um, the Center for Inequality um, mm. at Wits University, because they, of course, do extensive um, work and forecasting and, and research in that regard. And a basic thing would just be to think about the kind of budgets that are passed in our parliament and who are these budgets actually serving. So if you take, mm -hmm. let's say, an area like policing, we are all worried about crime in this country. And yet year on year, um, we have seen less spend uh, on policing, yes, the police budget may have increased, but the allocations in that budget, you see less spend coming to you and I than you do, let's say, going towards VIP protection um, that, of course, is in place for ministers, MECs, whoever else, um, you know, is, is regarded to fit the profile for VIP protection. And so it's in things like that where you begin to really um, question and make sense of where do the interests and where do the priorities of our government really lie? That 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 for me is just a, a, a simple example that that I can pick on to say, if we had parliamentarians across the board that were truly interested in a pro poor agenda, we would not be passing the kind of budgets that we pass and even a conversation around a basic income grant or how we offer social security to the most vulnerable in our in our in our society would not take the kind of turn that it does that it needs convincing that it needs lobbying i think about what it took to even have the 350 SRD grant implemented it took lobbying it took so much of a push push coming through uh, from different stakeholders in our society, and yet it was in the midst of a crisis. So uh, for me, having a pro-poor agenda will, would speak to intention from the get-go, that whatever it is that is decided on, and I will center on, on the budget, because that really 
is what tells us what is the vision, where is the money going. If you follow the money, then it speaks to what the intent of, of the government really is. Thanks, Kathy. Prof, over to you. The lady went first. <laughs> the lady <that> went first. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I would like to, 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 to perhaps um, um, engage with a few points um, that, were, that were made um, by Kathy. And, um, um, and we begin to examine the, the stance of our, of our, of our leaders. You know, she was um, speaking about the issue of um, the increase um, in crime, in, in, in crime protection or crime, crime uh, prevention, um, that type of a thing, increase in police. Now, it, 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 it betrays a lack of sensitivity because in a country where you see increasing unemployment, inevitably, you are going to see an increase in crimes. And so you say then that your measure is to protect those who have been, crimi you know, um, criminalized. Because when you, you subject and expose people to poverty, inevitably you, you are going to make them criminals. Once I was, I was driven by a particular lady, very beautiful lady, she was a taxi driver. And she says to me, and I, I, I fully understood that. She said to me, listen, that um, if my children are hungry, I will do anything for them. And by that anything, I understood that she meant she would rob a bank if she had to. Um, she will prostitute herself if she had to. But there was no way that she was going to allow her children to starve while she, she was just looking on. So therefore, in the midst of everything that is taking place around us, and in the midst of, of um, you know, why are, are people so daring? Now, in terms of, um, you know, committing crimes, robbery and all of that, because they see the kind of politician that we have, the kind of politician that we have is a sophisticated criminal, you know, is one that takes from the public purse and, um, you know, in the same breath then says that the criminal must be apprehended. Um, and the people, the people are not stupid. They see how corrupt our politicians are. And so they say that as a result of these, uh, you know, uh, corrupt politicians, we are sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into There is nothing else that they can do. They even reason that uh, if they commit crimes and are arrested, at least in prison, they've got a safe place to sleep. They secure water. Uh, there is food three, at least uh, two or three times a day. That's, what, that's how they reason. And so, you know, further, um, you were saying earlier on that, um, you know, the politicians are saying this and that in terms of the poor. Yes, but, you know, we, we have come to learn. We don't have to quote Franz Fanon, but perhaps we need to. And Franz Fanon, because paid heavy attention, serious attention to this thing, is that the declaration of negation is not negation. And in this country, what we have seen, we have seen more the politics of exchange rather than the politics of change. You know, we have seen uh, people who were yesterday on the margins, today being in parliament and wanting to behave um, like they are because they were envious yesterday. And you see people who claim to be committed to the people driving huge cars into the township, beautiful cars, wearing expensive clothes. One time a few years ago, you know, you, you see a typical thing when a particular political party celebrates a birthday. There is a huge cake and some people who are holding glasses and they celebrate champagne and they eat cake and the poor are watching. If the people can be that insensitive, what kind of people are these? And they, they say, one of them was saying, who claims to be very now much a pro, uh, the poor, was saying that, uh, you know, there were a lot of babes in one party and there was a lot of booze where young women, you know, are made, are reduced and are objects, are objectified by our politicians. And the young people are made to be envious of that kind of life. What kind of people are these? Um, there's a question which I want to come, which I'm going to ask, which someone's put there. And I want to come back to something else because you were also talking about hope uh, earlier, uh, Professor. 
But the question is regarding pro-poor. Is, for example, the NHI a genuine pro-poor policy or is it an election ploy? Uh, or is it just another opportunity to divert wealth to the hands uh, of the government? I, I guess if, if one does have an NHI that's functional, it can really benefit the lives of people. But in our country at the moment, your sense of uh, this whole big uh, question, which I see is in the news again, about the NHI. Uh, Kathy? Look, I, you know, I, I think from a, a conceptual point of view, universal health care is not just about the poor. I think it's about humanity. Mm. All we have to do is you need to sit down and look at your medical bills, right? Over the last five years, how much of an increase have you had in the amount of money that you're paying and contributing towards your medical bills? If you're on a medical aid that rate of inflation, it's the one part of inflation, it's, it's the one sort of cost that seems to outpace inflation each and every year. So what is not in dispute is that we simply cannot afford to continue with things the way they are, because by the time I'm 50 years old, I'm just not going to be able to afford <laughs> to, get, um, to get care. And so it's not just about the poor, I think um, universal health care is exactly that, making sure that everybody who needs access to health care is able to get it when they need it. Now, the question that arises in South Africa is the how do we achieve this? And uh, by the way, the idea of universal health care has been adopted and endorsed by the United Nations. So I think mm. that there is a global context in which South Africa's position is coming from. Now, the implementation part, the how we do that in South Africa is what has caused the controversy. Um, it's both good and bad. I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of very legitimate questions that need to be answered where the NHI is concerned have sort of been hijacked for whatever purposes. So the conversation that needs to be happening around the NHI is not actually happening. Instead, what we have is, you know, a dichotomy that has been created. If you believe it's good, then you support it. If you believe it's bad, then you think that healthcare is going to go to the dogs, which is not necessarily helpful to the conversation that we need to be having around the NHI because we need all the systems currently involved in healthcare to be working and to be working together in order to make sure that um, the access to healthcare that each of us deserve is something that we can create for the future. So the genuine questions now are going to get lost in the fear mongering around, is this now an imminent collapse? And there are legitimate questions around implementation, around budgeting, that around resources. So how is this going to be resourced that the government um, needs to answer? But I think that part of that is going to be lost in um, defending the need for an NHI, um, which, again, is, is not helpful. We, everybody, most people at least, agree on the fact that we need some kind of universal health care. So no, it's not just um, an election ploy. The conversation around the NHI started years back. In fact, almost now over a decade ago, it began. The, the, the issue is that between then and now, the kind of work that needed to be done to give people the confidence they would need to be comfortable with government running the project has not happened. Instead, there's been a continuation of a trust deficit, there's been an increase in corruption, and ultimately it results in what we are seeing today. Thank you, Kathy. Prof, do you want to um, add anything uh, to that? No, um, I'm, I'm just glad you, 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 um, you know, Kathy said something very interesting in her response. She says that by the time she's 50 years old, and now we realize that she's a baby, she is still yet to get 50, you know, uh, and some <laughs> of us have gone. <laughs> 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 and, 
imagine Kathy being so afraid, you know, um, not even there yet. And what about us? We're already <laughs> at that point. <laughs> We, we can't afford to have um, young people like Kathy who are afraid. They need to be very courageous, you know, for us and, and be very strong and daring. So, Kathy, we need you to lead us in courageous struggles and not express anxieties and fears, especially in the midst of the other people who are sharing this space with us. Having said that then, that um, it is inevitable that, um, you know, politicians will always um, um, express or speak a language as it has always been historically the case. The kind of language that they know will appeal to the people. They will always articulate the anxieties of the people at any time, but especially during the time of the elections. But then, um, you know, and I'm responding to the question first and foremost, it is, is it an election ploy? Um, and so the, the, the people must always look um, and look at the track record of political parties and at what the politicians have said um, verbally and what they have done practically. Um, um, those, those who are interested um, you know, in, in studying history. And it's very important to do so for all of us to, to do the best that we can you know, to scrutinize um, those um, who claim to, to represent us because, um, you know, it is precisely uh, they thrive on the ignorance of the people uh, because they think that people suffer from amnesia. And so they can always do things, you know, that they want to do because they know that people do not have a sense of history. Um, you would have a man who has been a president for a number of years and the deputy president for a number of years belonging to a particular party and suddenly telling us that the party that he has belonged to all these years for, for almost all his life, you know, has been selling out and all of that. And he was part and parcel of that, that um, you know, saying that. And, and of course, believing that uh, those of us who are not smart are going to fall for that. And he himself is this angel. And of course, you know, someone else coming around who has been with that person speaking very radical language, having been involved all those years and suddenly realizing that uh, these people have been sellouts. And yet at one stage, he had even claimed that he would die uh, for such people and uh, he would do anything and everything for such people. So, you know, when you do those kinds of things, you, 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 you take people for granted um, and you, you're exploiting um, you know, their vulnerability. But, um, you know, we expect those kinds of things um, from people. But having said all of that, let me then reiterate the point that, um, you know, the, the sometimes the, we, we see uh, particular fears being um, aired and, and ventilated. Um, um, and we are given a false impression, and, and this impression must be tackled head on, because we're always given a false impression that uh, the public uh, sector, uh, peopled by, by, by some, some politicians, is inherently corrupt, and that the private sector is inherently corrupt-free. And yet we know, even at this very moment, that uh, the politicians across, uh, you know, are being financed by business people. They are being financed by business people. They are being financed by the private sector who have got their own particular interests to the tune of millions of rents. Um, that is taking place. And so, uh, but a false impression is being given that uh, if things are privatized and all, but uh, you know, so for some of us, experience has taught us that uh, wherever privatization has reared its ugly head, you know, the consequences has always have always been the suffering of the poor, and so um, in in commitment committed to 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 an unequivocally being pro poor, um, my my sense is that um, you know everyone healthcare is an inalienable right for all human beings, you know, um, and and that should be the case. One should not you know, have access to health care on the basis of what he or she has in her or his pocket or what he or she does not have in his pocket. One should not, um, you know, uh, stay in prison 
being innocent, but because he or she does not have the kind of money that can buy or uh, uh, hire him or her, you know, good lawyers, then that person will rot in prison. But people who have committed crime, because they have a lot of money in their pockets, they are declared, and you know, the, it's very interesting the way the, the, the law says it, it says not guilty. It does not say innocent. It says not guilty on the basis of available evidence. And because the, the lawyers could play around with words and evidence and, and all of that, or lack of evidence, people who are guilty get away and people who are innocent go to prison uh, because they, they are poor. And so those are the kinds of issues then, you know, that... Uh, um, that uh, that uh, we are we are looking up to the kind of leadership that is going to be genuine and sincere. I am I am hopeful. In as much as I'm seeing this death around us, the, such leaders can and and must emerge. Um, and and if and when they emerge as as history, the history of the revolution has always taught us that uh, when revolutionaries genuinely emerge, never mind that they are undermined, the people hear them. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much, Prof. I want to uh, use, you mentioned the word hopeful then again, and I want to uh, just maybe change the, the direction. I see there's some questions, change the direction slightly here to ask. We, we are seeing as we approach this election as part of the state of the nation, we are seeing the emergence of uh, so many other uh, voices, other parties that um, Kathy mentioned as well, how many will be on the ballot. But we're seeing people like, um, uh, you know, uh, Bosasa, we've seen Action SA, uh, Rizam Zanzi, the, these kind of new kids on the block. Is this not a healthy sign? Is this not a hopeful sign that democracy in this country is uh, working, uh, that something is happening? Um, Kathy, your thoughts about, about that uh, and the rise of these, of these new uh, parties? Um, you know, I, it, it should be a healthy sign, but I'm going to answer this one based on just what um, a lot of our listeners have been saying to us more and more mm. when people call into the show, despite the fact that we have all of these options, you still get a general frustration of people not knowing who to vote mm. for. So mm. that, I think, highlights um, something that we need to, well, that the political parties themselves also need to be interrogating. and the people that lead those organizations because, you know, with so many options on the table, one is should be spoiled for choice. One should feel that they're spoiled for choice. But more and more, um, the sense that I'm getting, uh, again, just based on the conversations we're having, is of people who are confused, uh, people who are unsure, really, about what to do with their vote. Do you think this this has got something to do with a, with a kind of um, psychological state of the nation. I, I, I mean, I've said I said this uh, not so long ago that you know you speak about two two nations, Kathy, and are we living in a, in a, in a, in rather depressed state altogether as a nation? But that that depressed state is very different for these different nations. So on one hand, you've got people who have got access who are complaining about crumbling infrastructure, potholes, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of everything's just falling apart. Part. On the other hand, you've got people that are saying our hopes have been dashed because we've never been able to move from uh, the situation of poverty that we found ourselves in. And therefore, and therefore, there's a kind of uh, psychological approach to uh, uh, voting where maybe you do see that people just say, well, uh, who do we do? Who do we trust? Because our, our hopes have been dashed already. Is there something there? Uh, prof, I don't know. What would you say? Um, look, I, I do think that there is a, a level of disillusionment um, that the that the electorate is 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 going through. But I do think that the political parties need to ask themselves much tougher questions than they do right now around mm. their existence and perhaps their inability to reach the millions of of. Some other Africans that they could potentially be reaching. Prof. Thank you very much, Father. <clears throat> Let us begin at the point you were, you were raising earlier on. 
about um, you know democracy uh, is it uh, being enriched is it being entrenched um you know there are people in this country who out of um, an, extreme anger and frustration are saying that look um apartheid was better than this some people are saying that and they are saying this because there was a point in time when uh, you know people used it it doesn't matter how low lowly they were paid but there was work um there were jobs and this and this and that and we know that from 1996 i think in 1996 um we were doing political economy also that again 9650000 jobs were lost and after and after things happened um and so people see that in the reality of their lives things are not changing and so those who then are able like you and i have the you know the the space to articulate our views kathy is a, is a broadcaster i am a lecturer and all of that um things are rough but not as rough as for those who do not even have so for some of us we we say uh, because we we can pick up a phone and make a phone call but there are people who can hardly buy a half a loaf of bread so um for them you know they they only get to be able to express themselves if they are lucky enough that a particular tv station goes to them and see that there is no water and all of that other than that they once in a while their frustrations are aired but every day they are condemned to poverty every day they are condemned to suffering that is the reality for this so those who uh drive home and have um, you know they they have remote controls for their gates um are now telling us that things are not the way they used to be as if in the first place you know that uh, this uh, this um, this kind of um, um um a reality is a gift to the people the people pay their high price many people died for this uh you know um, and others were injured in one way or the other for this so democracy democracy that comes once in 5 years time or that allows people to speak um is meaningless when the people are merely given a platform to air their frustrations and nothing and nothing is concretely changing and in this case i'm reminded you know by one of our greatest scholars and thinkers amelka kabra he said that the people are not fighting for the ideas in anyone's head they want to see concrete and material changes that's what they fight for they want to see an improvement in their daily in their daily lives if that is non existent then everything is meaningless and so um to hear uh, people tell us that uh, people can uh, you know there is freedom of association there is freedom of speech there is freedom of this but there is no freedom from hunger it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything and 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 father you know i always wonder i hear people some parties they they tell us what what does hope mean what what does it really mean does it mean and because you know what what may appear as hope those who are comfortable in one way or the other may be hoping for something better but those who see you know their lives being um, you know deteriorating everything every day for them it it there is no no, no such hope it is an illusion so um we we then try to grapple and to find meanings um uh, for these and 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 those who are in a gloomy situation see nothing nothing happening thanks prof i want to come uh, we've got about 7 8 minutes left i want to uh, just come to uh, some of the questions people are asking someone says i'm a socialist at heart surely to be pro poor is to support more state planning of the economy and state institutions nationalization in order to allow the economy to serve the poor aligning ourselves with china perhaps a chinese model of economy but saying this seems to alienate the global powers that be are there any parties that are le- meaning this way other than a neo fascist party like the EFF uh Kathy can I throw that one at you that that are leaning which way uh, nationalization that are leaning 
uh, yeah, that are leaning to a more uh, Chinese model of economy, perhaps, uh, which may alienate us from global powers. Are there any parties that are leaning in this way other than a neo-fascist party like the EFF? Look, I, I guess we've got we've got a a few parties, but you know, if you're talking about the the idea of a socialist voice in its truest sense, interestingly, um, Ibrahim Harvey recently um, penned together an, an article, and he was formerly with uh, Kosatu, is a a long time trade unionist and activist, and he was making the point that for him in this election, there is actually a missing. Um, socialist voice that, you know, you've got the interests of the poor, interests of uh, the working class that are simply not represented in a way that um, somebody like him would would have wanted to see. But, I mean, if you, if, if you mean just from a rhetoric point of view, look, you've got a uh, you've got quite a few options if you go down if you go down the list of parties you know there's no shortage you've got uh, your mk um yes you've got the eff you've got your atm um you've got um your various uh, some of the the different forums uh, those that are registered under forums so I, I don't think that there's a shortage of 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 parties that uh, say that that would be part of what their ideological leaning uh, would be. And in fact, uh, they've all made a decision um, to work together um, in, in this election and whatever the outcome of that election might be. So you are likely to see them coalescing around uh, similar interests, but I'm sure Prof has a much better answer. I doubt Kathy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> just want to say that declaring oneself a socialist does not make one a socialist. And, um, you know, making particular articulated expressions do not necessarily result into concrete realities. And therefore, what am I trying to say? People, people, people ask, so what now? That is the question, what to do? I had this question, uh, you know, they quote Lenin, uh, what what is to be done? I had the former president asking that question. He loves that question. What is to be done? Um, what we need in our societies, and I'm speaking of that as, as as an ordinary member of the society, is that in our society there there must be some of us who are organized um, in whatever societies or groupings we are. Those of us who are not interested in being voted into political offices and all of that but who are very interested and who are deeply active, um, who are going to engage with the communities in educating one another and en enlightening one another about issues so that once we have enlightened and, and politically informed and educated masses of people, then those enlightened, and, 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 and perhaps I sound idealistic, but I sincerely believe in this. Those of us who do that and begin to say that, you know, um, we are not disinterested, but we would be able to say, we believe that so-and-so, so-and-so could do the job better. And I, simple as a I am not stepping up. I'm not going to parliament, but, uh, you know, I'm doing something else as a community member. And But we, we cannot afford, as, as citizens of the country and people in general, um, to, be, to, to, to be despondent, to be hopeless, and to be helpless. When we do that, we are doing exactly what our politicians are because if many of us simply do nothing and only say 10% uh, of people come up and go to vote, it will be those people who are then going to determine their agenda and, and there's little or nothing that we can do to change our, our situation. There are no easy answers because we are dealing with very complex issues and so we've got to be thinking deeply and deeply, deeply and deeper and deeper and deeper about these challenges that are confronting us and that we are confronting. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we have two more things here. I just want to, uh, maybe we can just give, because I'm watching the time, uh, to just look at very shortly. Someone saying, do political parties punt pro-poor manifestos because it's an easy emotional hook to score votes from the most desperate South Africans? But what I'm not seeing in manifestos across the board is how we lift South Africans out of poverty. How many parties are speaking about this in concrete terms? 
Is there a general lack of hopelessness or lack of imagination among political parties that lays a vision for a different future for those who live at the mercy of our failing structures? Uh, so maybe uh, just to narrow that down, do you think we suffer from a lack of imagination among our political parties and a lack of vision in this country. Kathy. I, w I, was, I was hoping that you'd toss that one um, to, to Prof. Look, let me maybe answer the question in this way. What the political parties all do is they promise jobs, right? Everybody's been promising jobs. A job in every home will create more jobs and, 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 and. So that perhaps in an of itself answers the question that the issue of dealing with poverty in this country is a lot more complex and perhaps that is where uh, our greatest challenge might be that it's such a complex problem that nobody actually has um, you know one finite answer it's probably mm -hmm. part of the reason why uh, we're also now dealing with calls for um, for a, a national dialogue. So I, I don't want to get into whether they're imaginative enough or not. Uh, I think it, it, everybody will be able to uh, draw their own conclusions based on my answer. So what we have a promise of is a job in every home, not a promise of eradication of, of, of poverty. Um, I see there's another question around um, anti-abortion and anti-death penalty, just quickly. Um, I know that the ACDP is anti-abortion. I know that the Freedom Front Plus is anti-abortion, but they are pro-penalty. Uh, just uh, to to answer those the, the, those that question as well, Prof. Prof. Very uh, very briefly, uh, Fanda. You know, being imaginative on its own uh, in isolation is not enough. Being hopeful on its own is not enough. And even being committed or sincere, all of those factors combined in, in isolation are not enough. Um, but I think that a point of departure should be sincerity. A point of departure should be commitment. And once you have those in place, um, and of course, consciousness comes before all of those. Um, and once we have all those in place, then, you know, a plan. Um, and, and knowing pretty well that uh, life throws struggles and challenges to us all the time. But if we're genuine and committed and sincere um, to change the condition of the poor and not pretend, the, 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 what I see now on the part of many politicians and even those, even during the liberation struggle, the liberation struggle taught us that many of us got involved in the struggle only because we were on the receiving end personally. But once we were in positions where we could have access, you know, to power, access to privilege, access to everything, then we turned on our backs um, on, on, on the masses of the people. And so it shows that in the very first place, there was never a revolutionary consciousness there. There was never a commitment to the poor because when you have a commitment to a particular idea, it is not a question of convenience. It is a question of principle. Thank you, Prof. I just read the final uh, thing here in the box. Uh, it's maybe more thought for us to consider than a question. The poor are not stupid. They are not ignorant or in need of our assistance. To be pro-poor should surely simply mean that they also receive what we all have. It should begin with due diligence at municipal level, fixing neighborhoods, schools, policing, and power. If we can't do these basic things, why try the things that most developed nations are not getting, uh, are not getting uh, right or managing? To me, that sounds like a ruse. Being pro-poor, in my view, is not in the first place ideological. It has to be a roll up your sleeves type of thing. South Africans would vote for anyone that provides those very basic things. And if given the basics, they will easily be able to do the rest for themselves just like anyone else in this country is forced to do anyway. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to comment on that, but uh, we can uh, we can uh, otherwise leave that as a, as a prof. You want to say something? No, I was going to say that I was going to defer to Kathy. You know, those who have the first word must have the last word as well. <laughs> Kathy, would you like to offer us a closing thought? 
seen as well, no, Prof, as put you there? I, I think that most South Africans are aware of just um, how important this election is. And as we navigate who and what we should who we should vote for um, and what the interests that we as individuals are after, I think that we should all keep in mind that democracy is about participation. And we are the ones that determine the quality of democracy that we have. So it is ultimately going to be up to us as citizens to demand more, to demand better, and to truly work this democracy out for ourselves to be something that we want it to be. So the opportunity for me in this election is perhaps a wake-up call to us as South Africans that perhaps for too long we have outsourced our responsibilities um, as active citizens. We have outsourced our thinking and contributions that we should be making uh, and we should be giving towards making this country what we think it can be. Um, I think part of the reason why there are these frustrations with the fact that there are all of these options to pick from, but people don't really know um, who and what to choose is because ultimately we know, we can see that perhaps some of the best answers to our problems are not lying in political organizations, they're lying with us. So we need to stop deferring that participation. We need to stop being quiet about what the state of affairs is. We need to get involved and be involved throughout and work this democracy out for ourselves. Because as long as we don't do that, we're going, we're going to continue to see leaders that disappoint, whether it's at a municipal level, um, at a provincial level, at a national level, and we would only have ourselves to blame for that. So, Professor Simpiba Sesanti, uh, thank you so much for your time uh, this evening, for the thoughts that you've offered. I think you have really got us thinking about a number of different things. Uh, we've been a little bit all over the place, but I think these are the issues of uh, South Africa today. Kathy Mothafana, thank you as well so much, Kathy, for your time uh, this evening. Uh, you'll have to go to UWC to uh, attend lectures by Prof Professor Sesanti, but do tune in every day, Monday to Friday, nine to midday, uh, to Talking Point on SAFM because Kathy does have some fantastic stuff on there. And certainly at the moment, many of the issues we've spoken about, she digs into uh, in depth. So I want to thank you both very much. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. We'll be back on Thursday night looking at what might be uh, post the 29th of May. What might the political conglomerate conglomerations look like post uh, the 29th uh, of May? So if you can join us, uh, we will be happy to have you with us. So. Good night, everybody, and thank you once again.